Our next presenter is Greg Shea. Uh, Greg began experimenting with DSP and digital audio in 1980 by connecting a uh, hand-built resistor to DNA to his good old Radio Shack Trash 80. So um, I think we've all done a few things like that. Greg designed the first 16-track digital audio workstation for the PC in 1989 as a co-founder co of Spectral Synthesis, which became the heart of the uh, uh, Eurofax RS1 digital? Euphonics. Euphonics, yeah. Okay. Um, in the early 90s, uh, with the demands of, and collaboration of multi-room audio facilities and simulated interest in research into audio networking, joining Telos in 1997, this came to fruition as an inventor of the Telos Livewire audio network technology. Greg was a member of the AES subcommittee that created the new AES 67 networked audio standard. And with that, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. And uh, thank you for taking your time to uh, come and hear my presentation. Um, what I'm going to talk today about is uh, moving the audio processing from boxes to the cloud and how AES 67 uh, is a particular good, uh, is part of that. What I'm going to talk about is how the, the technology of audio over IP affects the way that you build facilities. It changes the way that you get work done. So I'm going to go over that and this applies for radio, TV, uh, OB vans, um, actually it applies to uh, a broad scale of uh, facilities for audio. I'm going to talk about the why it is AES 67, which is audio over IP uh, layer 3, is the enabling factor in the evolution that's changing. Um, and then the way I'm going to tell the story is I'm going to kind of go over, if you look back uh, 20, 30 years, how the design of a radio facility has evolved. And that will kind of put into perspective uh, where we were, where we are, where we're going. So, um, just a couple of words. If you're not familiar with um, AES 67, um, it is a uh, standard that came out in uh, about a year and a half ago, but it's based on 15 years of experience uh, of audio over IP, specifically like with uh, from Axia Livewire. So even though it seems like it's new, it actually has very deep roots. Um, to summarize a little bit, AES67 allows for multicast and unicast network routing. Um, it gives you the ability to have thousands of channels in your facility and all of those channels available everywhere. So this has been the fundamental reason for building uh, radio facilities because you don't need a big audio router. You don't need thousands of cables anymore. Everything just plugs together. Um, you can use one network. Uh, it does need to be a QoS network, quality of service. Um, you can do the control, configuration, logic control, contact closure, I.O., all over the same network. Using the network allows you to find out what equipment is on. Uh, typically, uh, I was trying to point out here that um, using the IP network is useful for more things than just the audio. It's also using, usable for um, managing all of your equipment. Maintenance um, makes the job of uh, taking care of the facility much easier. So the most important value of IP networking is the fact that, in effect, you are what you connect to. And computer networks connect to everything. Uh, in our modern world, everything is based on a computer. Uh, server platforms, software, it's the, it's the very lifeblood and structure. And what we did specifically was bring audio into that connectivity. And you also pick up robustness and redundancy from IT technology, and I also should say economy, uh, because one of the big driving factors is that there's a you know, the multi-billion dollar industry of networking, and they make these really cool switches in high capacity equipment, and we just hook our cart to that horse and take advantage of it without uh, having to invent all that. So, as I mentioned, even though AES 67 is based on um, 
the know-how from the past 15 years, the standard does include a couple of innovations. And these are solutions for the new use cases going forward. So it's not just a representation of the best practice of the past, but it is this door for how we're going to be building facilities for uh, many years in the future. And the core of this is the difference of how you use multicast and unicast. Um, multicast you typically use inside your facility. Uh, it's where you have all the channels available all everywhere all the time. And this is like a core value for uh, inside the facility. Um, whereas unicast is better suited for going point to point um, over a wide area network a long distance. And if you're familiar at all with uh, the Telos product of Zephyr, uh, been used for many, many years for carrying high quality audio over a long distance for remote broadcast and uh, you know remote hosting. So we put a unicast mode into AES 67 as the wide area networks get faster, you'll find it easy to make these very high quality connections. So this is essentially showing uh, the same thing I was just talking about. Um, and this is illustrating why there was an issue. And the issue is, even though multicast is really convenient, um, it just is not available on most wide area networks and um, also on the internet. And I want to make clear that I'm not talking about using AES 67 over the internet. Um, it does require quality of service. But what's happening is many of these high bit rate uh, wide area networks are becoming more and more available. We're seeing it um, all over the world. And I'm convinced that very uh, rapidly uh, the bit rates available are going to be going up and up. Um, the bit rate of a 24-bit, 48 kilohertz uncompressed audio channel is about 2.5 megabits. This January, um, there was a news item of the fastest commercial fiber optic network. 100 gigabits is available uh, commercially. And it happens to be in Cleveland, where Telos is from. No connection, actually. The building is um, go out the back door one block over, and we're trying to find a way for them to give us uh, better uh, uh, and cheaper um, connectivity. This is the fundamental new ability that can change how we're going to build facilities, being able to go over long distance with the audio over IP um, with a high quality WAN with, uh, with quality of service. I'm talking about this because if you're familiar with um, many of the audio over IP solutions, they're typically all multicast. So I'm specifically pointing out uh, the unicast mode. Each of these represent uh, difficult, uh, different geographical locations using a wide area network. I didn't talk about the fact that AES 67 specifically was designed for inter-vendor operation and giving an ironclad set of parameters that everybody must implement. And then this guarantees that different vendors' equipment uh, connect together. You can have a technology, you can have a standard, and if all the vendors don't implement it the same way, you don't have the interoperability. Another thing I should mention is in using this mode uh, does require synchronization globally. Each, each of these locations uh, would need to be synchronized. AES 67 use, uses IEEE 1588 precision time protocol. That same time protocol is being adopted by SMPTE. Uh, the same protocol is used for AVB, and it's used in uh, high-speed trading on uh, Wall Street. So it's, it's becoming uh, ubiquitous. We're essentially relying on this uh, synchronization mechanism that exists. So I talked about what AES 67 is and some of the things that it can do. So to try to help put into perspective how this changes the design of our uh, radio broadcast facilities, um, I'm just going to go through, which is just illustration. Um, for instance, I broke down the evolution of how facilities are designed into eight stages. And this will help put into context uh, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. So of course, what we used to do years ago, analog, plug everything together with cables. Lots of cables. Lots of broken cables. Um, then, uh, in the mid-80s, we uh, discovered digital audio, uh, AES-EBU, 
Uh, Maddie also fits into this uh, category. So we still had the cables. And then we found, well, we need to synchronize things together. And guess what? There's even more cables. Then clever people started building facilities this way where with a time domain multiplex box in the middle, at least you reduced the number of cables and you had central routing. So this was probably dominant uh, in the 90s. So here we are about the year 2000. I know when we first started doing work with audio over IP. And notice I mentioned here that this same topology is, can be done with AVB. And this is kind of where AVB came from. And the idea is that you still have a guy in the middle. Uh, but now it's not a super expensive audio TDM matrix router, but it's a network switch, which given, like I said, driven by the economy of the, the, the rest of the industries becomes uh, a fraction, a tiny fraction of the cost of purpose-built equipment. So this is how for 12 years, uh, Axia has been building uh, many, many radio facilities around the world. Uh, the current number is up to... Uh, uh, over 6,000 radio studios live on the air, uh, essentially built this way with a network in-house, all channels available everywhere. So here's where we're up to step number four. We have four more to go. And this is where we step into the present and going into the future. Because when you are on IP layer three, it's routable, which means you can get out of the building. You can go other places. And that's huge, because now you're not just connected inside your studio, but you begin to have those connections outside the studio. And like I mentioned at the beginning, this, is, this does require a, a quality of service wide area network, uh, but those are now becoming available. Actually, when we first did the work with Livewire in uh, around 1999, we figured that someday the networks outside the studio would catch up. And so if we would start using audio over IP in the studio, when that day came, then the door would open and we would then connect to the rest of the world. It just took 15 years to get there. Things take a lot longer sometimes than you uh, expect. So the sixth step is this, where now you, this represents multiple geographic locations that can work together as one studio. There are low latency modes for the audio over IP. Within the studio, we can go uh, in a microphone, through the network, to the mixing, back over the network to your headphones uh, in less than three milliseconds. So it's a very low latency. It feels very live. That's why we gave it the name Livewire. You get into these situations where you're geographically located, and um, Einstein says, no, sorry, there's a speed limit. So you begin to get multiple milliseconds of delay just you know, getting around uh, the world. I was at a demonstration uh, a couple of years ago where they played a string quartet. Two of the players were in San Diego, uh, the other two were up in San Francisco, and using the low latency audio over IP, they played together and uh, you could not tell any difference that they were not in the same room. And if you think about that, even though there was about eight to ten milliseconds of delay, including going up and down the coast to California, ten milliseconds means, you know, you're sitting in two chairs ten feet apart which, of course, uh, is, is very natural. So there are potentials here for working together, even though you're separated, just as if you're uh, in, the, in one location. Now we're getting into the advanced stuff. People are actually building facilities this way. And what this represents is different geographic locations whereby you're um, putting most of your equipment centralized for maintenance, for, for uh, organization, and you put just the minimum amount uh, remotely. Uh, the BBC is doing a major program this way called uh, Vylor, where they put most of the equipment in London and just the minimum amount in each of the studios. So if you didn't have the routable network, which AES67 is, you wouldn't be able to do this. And so finally, the step of the evolution is this, to where that central group of equipment Maybe you don't want to maintain your own rack of servers. Maybe you want to pay somebody else who is really good at providing uh, compute power and connectivity in the cloud. So this is where we went. we've completed the evolution all the way from a bunch of boxes connect together to where we're now taking advantage of economic resources uh, from third parties. 
And again, the enabling factor is we had routable network audio over IP. So this is kind of a summary. It kind of shows where we were and this is about maybe where we're at right here and where we're going and there are some people there and I just wanted to show um, this helps realize the contrast because you can do this with AVB but you can't go any further. The, the WAN connections would use this um, unicast mode of AES67 and inside the studio you could use multicast. So we specifically designed AES67 uh, planning for this future. So this is just an observation that I made that if you think about it, you're no longer designing a facility and then figuring out to, how to hook it up. Um, the design of the facility is defined by fitting into this IP network infrastructure. So the, the IP network is essentially the ecosystem that you're trying to fit into. So it kind of turns it inside out. Okay, so and this is just my opinion, but what do you think the most valuable thing is that audio over IP connects directly to? Let's see if anybody has a guess what I'm thinking. See if you can tell what I'm thinking. Okay, that's certainly very valuable. That wasn't what I was thinking. <laughs> anybody? Okay, so my answer is software. Okay, because what's happening is we're fundamentally moving from a box, a uh, physical box uh, product, to because we're on the IP network, standard IP network that's in every server, we're getting our MIPS from these servers, it's enabling products to be software. It's going to enable um, ad advances and innovations to happen as fast as people can write software. It's not a whole bunch of hardware anymore. This is already starting to happen. Uh, this is just an example from uh, Linear Acoustic is uh, one of the members of the uh, TELUS Alliance and they went to sell 110 TV audio processors to MTV and MTV said we don't want 110 of these boxes on our shelves. We want your software to run on our servers and that's indeed how we sold it. So it's kind of this idea of um, bring your own server. So we feel that um, the way I've been expressing this is in three to five years, half of our customers are probably going to want to buy our products as software. Now, we know there's always going to be, be people that want to buy it as a hardware appliance. So we know that um, we essentially have to uh, deliver both. And in R&D where I work, it means that we're planning on that so that it's not two completely separate uh, development efforts. That's, that's basically the end of my presentation. Um, I do want to mention a little bit about what uh, Livewire plus AES67 means. Um, if you know, Livewire's been around a long time. We've had a successful program of the technology. Um, we worked very hard on getting, taking that experience and helping turn that into this industry standard. And we um, talked a lot about AES67 maybe not so much about Livewire. So Livewire Plus is expressing the fact that Livewire is around and strong and healthy and now has something additional. It includes AES67. So you can read it as Livewire Plus as a new brand and also as Livewire Plus AES67. Well, thank, thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay.